Well, welcome everyone that's here, uh, that's visiting. Welcome to Hillside Community Church and for all the rest of you. It's so good to get together on Sunday morning to, to worship the Lord and to hear from His Word. So before, before I get into the Word this morning, um, let's just uh, bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for the peace that you bring. God, we thank you that we can focus on this season, on the various things that, uh, that make um, it special uh, to remember your coming to this world. Jesus, we know that you love each and every person that's here. And God, for those that are out there listening online too, God, I just pray, God, that our hearts would, would hear what you would have to say this morning through the word. And God, we, we just praise you for the peace that surpasses understanding, that guards our hearts and minds in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I was just thinking about, um, about Advent and um, about peace. And you know, um, the world cries out for it. And despite all the human efforts to pursue it, it seems that um, in this world of sin, peace remains elusive. And um, it's, it's sought by um, almost everybody on a daily basis. And I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that every person um, in this world is looking for peace. I think, though, people are looking for it in different directions. Some are looking for it in admiration or fame. Others look for it uh, through substances like alcohol and drugs. Some even try to pursue peace through a relationship or through a career. And all the while, people are seeking peace. We look across the planet and we see the conflicts on the world stage in places like the Ukraine and, and Israel. And uh, then we look at things uh, on a local level. We're not the center of the world's conflicts here in 100 Mile House, but we don't need to look much further than our own backyards to see troubling trends. Now, I mean, maybe I have a little bit more of a dib on what happens behind the scenes because of my involvement with the police services and, and seeing what comes into the detachment. And you know, I'm, I'm the guy that looks after the evidence in the detachment, so all that stuff comes to me. And, and you, when you pick a piece of evidence up, you wonder what, what is going through people's minds? What's happening out there to cause people to turn to such desperate measures? See, there is real violence in our society, but, uh, you know, it's not only about that, but in Canadian society, most of our wars outside of the, you know, small percentage aren't fought with a sword or a gun or a knife. But you look around and, and, you, and you, your ears are open. And, and you very often see people pursuing violent agendas. And, and this happens within the greater community and, and in the family. Very often cutting and cruel words turn simple misunderstandings into aggressive power struggles. And wars on smaller scales are fought as people find weapons to cut down or to wound their perceived antagonists. You know, it's very apparent when we look across the board. And this should sober us. That from Cain and Abel to the Hatfields and the McCoys, if you remember that uh, saga, or to the Arabs and the Jews and what's going on in the Middle East right now. 
Violent conflict seems to be an, an, an inevitable aspect of being human. And sadly for the majority of humanity, God, the creator of the universe, has become the furthest thing from their minds. And not only does the human race find itself at war with itself, not only does the human race find itself embroiled in conflicts outside of self, but restless hearts bring us into conflict with our Creator as well. And all of this, what I'm describing here, this hostility that's around, is the result of humanity's fall into sin. And the Apostle Paul describes humanity's plights in the clutches of sin when he states in the book of Romans, chapter 1, Verses 28 to 31, he states this. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And despite all of the abundant blessings God has given us on this planet to enjoy, Regardless of our efforts to attain peace of mind by our own efforts, it seems that restlessness and malcontentment is an epidemic within the human heart. And this is where we find ourselves in context as a church, in this kind of world, in this kind of society. Concerning the heart that is not submitted to God, Isaiah the prophet spoke in Isaiah chapter 59, starting with verse 8. He says, concerning those that are far from God in their spirit, the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along with them will know peace. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our, our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. At the root of all the bitter conflict that we see is a restlessness in the heart of humanity. The restless heart that craves power over others and self-gratification at the expense of others is at the heart of every sinner. Jesus said in his great sermon in Matthew chapter 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. But try as people might in their own strength to be peacemakers. The apostle Paul puts it in his letter to the Romans, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So what hope is there for this restless heart of man? Many people try to turn inward for answers, only to find out that there is no answer from within. 
It's now become mainstream to encourage people to pursue Eastern meditation techniques to try and seek and unlock the power of self to gain a sense of inner peace. Now, Eastern meditation in our society is promoted as a way to reduce stress, to bring about relaxation, and even to manage depression. And there is a general assumption and belief that meditation is a secular technique and is good for everyone. But it was never meant for that purpose. It has always been designed by Eastern religious systems for attaining spiritual enlightenment. It's focused on the power of self with self being God. By always keeping the mind fixed on the self, the disciplined meditator empties his or her mind into supreme nothingness, which brings a temporary tranquility and artificial sense of peace. You see, the problem is, there is no lasting peace there can be no lasting peace by turning to yourself as the source. Those who practice deep forms of Eastern meditation eventually will find that emptying their consciousness of any external thoughts or stimuli does not bring them to a good place, but it actually transports them to a very dangerous place. A house swept clean is swept clean only to find out that there are eager spiritual entities, spiritual guides, waiting to influence and take possession of that internal space. Folks, the truth of the matter is, and I'm, I'm bringing this up because it's such a popular thing in our culture. The truth of the matter is that Eastern meditation in all of its forms may start appearing start out appearing as a good way to peace. But friends, it is a clever deception. It does not lead to peace. It leads to captivity. You see, we're not in a neutral world out there. There's a world outside of the seeing eyes that's all around us. There is the Lord and his angels and we have Satan and his angels. And they're all around. You see, the gurus of Eastern religion attempt to tell people that their teachings are in harmony with Christianity and that there's no harm in trying to use these techniques to attain inner peace. But I want to tell you that this is not the way of the gospel of Christ. If anyone comes to you with any other gospel that is in conflict with the pure teachings of Christ. Hear me out. If anyone comes to you with another gospel that is in conflict with the pure teachings of Christ, what they are teaching does not lead to truth, peace, or freedom, but spiritual bondage. Is it any wonder, though, like, we're not standing in neutral territory. This isn't a neutral ground that we're in. In 2 Corinthians 1, 13 to 15, Paul talks about people who are bringing such ideologies and claiming that they're in uh, harmony with Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 1, 13 to 15, we read, for such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Either something is truthful and of God or it is not. Brothers and sisters, 
I want to share with you, if, you, if you're messing around with Eastern meditation techniques, you need to run and get away from that. You need to do it now. This will poison you. It will end up hampering you in your walk with God. And if you're discovering, if you're just searching for truth right now, I'm going to tell you, there is truth, there is freedom, there is wholeness in Jesus Christ. There is hope for you. You don't have to walk this world alone in conflict inside. You can have inner peace, but that peace does not come from anything but the living God who has offered you his pathway to it. The only form of meditation that you need to come to inner peace is meditation on the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All other forms of meditation will take you further away from God. They're clever deceptions and only bring temporary feeling that you're at peace, but in the end, they will tangle you. Consider the words of David in Psalm 1. He said, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. People search for peace within themselves. But there is no peace until you find Jesus, until you cast yourself upon the Lord and his grace and his mercy. But how, Pastor? Try as I might, I find myself battling. I find myself battling with this hostility inside. You see, the scriptures do teach that us, we have sin natures. And the heart apart from God of man is desperately wicked and prone to wonder from the living God. We're unable to submit to God's law on our own because our nature is hostile to him. Human effort alone is not enough to attain the righteousness of God nor to enter his rest. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 3, 19 to 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world accountable, held accountable to God. Therefore, nobody will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. You can't make yourself good enough. You can't make yourself come to the place where you experience God's peace. It's not in you to do it. You can't do it. People have tried over the centuries unsuccessfully to find peace by striving for it on their own terms. See, this is why the Lord set the stage. He set the stage because he knew that humanity was unable to achieve peace. He knew that Humanity was unable to, have, to experience salvation on their own. The power of sin in the human heart is too strong for people to come to freedom and true peace. The world needs something more. The world needs a Savior 
who will rescue us from our helpless condition. And that's why the world of old needed a new covenant. And that's why we still need that new covenant today. John Hall, the lead singer of Casting Crowns, he wrote this in his song, What This World Needs. He says, what this world needs, what's, what, what this world's ne- world needs is not another one-hit wonder with an axe to grind, another two-bit politician peddling lies, another three-ring circus society. What this world needs is not another sign-waving super that thinks he's better than you, another ear-pleasing candy man afraid of the truth, another prophet in an Armani suit. What this world needs is a savior who will rescue a spirit who will lead, a father who will love them in their time of need. That's what this world needs. A savior that will rescue in the spiritual darkness that existed. God sent a man named Isaiah to predict what he was going to do sending his spiritual light into the world. The prophet described the coming of the world Savior in great detail, saying in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. This was a prophecy. Isaiah continues in verse 6 of the same chapter saying, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, prince of peace of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this and then we have a contemporary of the prophet isaiah the prophet micah who was given information as to where God's Messiah would have his start. And he says in Micah 5, 2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Fast forward from those two prophetic words, 700 years into the future, to where these prophecies came to pass. In Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 23, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had mind in, his, in, mind, in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And all of this took place After this happened, after this appearance, Joseph and Mary, who are living in the town of Nazareth, which I might say was in Galilee of the Gentiles, were compelled to visit the town of Bethlehem, the city of David where Jesus was born. 
in Luke 2, we read, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time for the baby, the time for the baby to be born, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But, an angel, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign unto you. You will find the baby wrapped in clo cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Folks, I wanted to read this story. We've heard it many times. We're talking about what this world needs in the form of peace. As Jesus started his ministry, we saw his light in the world as he showed us what God was like in the flesh. His teachings outlined a new way of thinking. A new covenant was ultimately enacted in his blood when he went to the cross to die as the savior of the world for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin because the penalty of sin is death. Jesus willingly poured out his blood into death so that by his pure, undefiled sacrifice, who would, whoever would place their trust in him by believing, that person would be forgiven of every sin that they had ever committed, no matter how grave those sins were. And although their sins were a great stain, they would be washed as white as pure, freshly fallen snow. And Jesus, Jesus was the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of the world. And Paul in his letter to the Romans has outlined how peace with God is only possible when a person humbly accepts his peace offering through grace given to us and offered to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is only when, only when a person humbly accepts that we can't change ourselves. I can't attain peace myself. I can't end the hostility in my heart myself. I'm completely helpless to do anything myself. I need a savior. I need someone who will rescue in my time of need. Are we needy people? Are we needy people? Yes, every one of us is. All of us need a savior who will rescue in our time of need. In his letter to the Romans, Paul continues to speak of the practical benefits of accepting the good news from Jesus. And this is the one who the Isaiah prophet called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Romans 5, verse 1, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us that there is no salvation outside of faith in the cleansing power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who makes a sinner clean. Jesus is the one who rescues. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the one who brings it to hearts that are yearning, to hearts that are hungry for truth, for hearts that are hungry to end hostility, for hearts that are hungry for tranquility. Jesus is the one. This work of justification comes directly from God as a work of his divine grace. None of us can earn it. None of us can find it on our own. It's not deserved, but it's freely granted to every one of us who would believe in God's only Son. This justification brings what the world seeks but has been unable to obtain through its works of self-realization. Peace with God is made possible by God and through God because of his great love for people, for humanity. There's an expression of joy here in these verses I read in Romans. Paul is genuinely excited about the truth of salvation given without a reservation to whoever would believe. It's freely given and freely received. Today, if you're living in darkness, if you're bound by chains of hostility, Jesus Christ can set you free, and who the Son sets free shall be free indeed. You can be forgiven. You can be set free. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. You can be free today. This is hope for your future. Hope for eternity. Don't settle for the scraps of this world that promise freedom but only give you chains of captivity. Who promise you light but you only fill your belly with more darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. If you come to him, he will illuminate your heart, set you free, and set you on a course for everlasting life. This is Christmas. This is what Christmas means. The peace that surpasses understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ when you place your trust in him. And saint of God, if you're here today and you're discouraged, take your eyes off the waves around you. Take your eyes off the circumstances that seem so hopeless. Turn your eyes to the Savior. Turn your eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, and he will lift you out of the mire. He'll grab you by the hand and he'll pull you out. Walk with him. Walk and step with him. He's calling to you, and he's not far off. He is right there. You just need to surrender your heart to him and let go of the things that have bound you. Oh, the wonderful work of the Savior is that he sets us free from the power of the rebellion that separates us from God. Ah, this new person is born again in the Spirit, awakened by God. The Prince of Peace resides inside of you if you believe. Let him have his way. Bow the knee to your Lord and Savior. This peace will settle on you even in, midst, in, the, in the midst of your deepest trials. Because the peace of God is not contingent upon the circumstances around you. The peace of God is a promise for all who trust in Christ. That's why the apostles 
Open the New Testament books. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because there is true grace. There is true peace that comes through Jesus. Church, rise up. Awaken to the fact that the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the whole universe, has extended his hand to you and he desires to live in you and through you to be ambassadors of his peace. So when you go out there in this world that is broken, in this world that is destroyed by its turning inward and trying to find peace within, you have the peace of God that surpasses understanding that flows out of you. Let the peace flow. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you who walk in step with the Spirit of God. Because if you walk in the step of the Spirit of God, you are a peacemaker. And you make a difference out there in the darkness of this world. <sighs> but this peace will only come to a person by genuine faith when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Some have prayed a prayer to Jesus, yet they've not experienced the peace of God in their lives and the problem lies not in the fact that it is not enough. What's been given to you is fully sufficient. Maybe the problem is that you've never fully surrendered. You've never fully received the Prince of Peace. Yes, you have a head knowledge. Yes, you had, you've had words uttered from your mouth, maybe. But your heart has never surrendered. Today is the day of salvation, friend. There are people that have gone to church their entire lives and don't know the Savior. Today is the day of salvation. If you're not at peace inside, you need to surrender to the Lord. He's inviting you to his table. And when he, he says, son or daughter, I have a loaf of bread for you to, to feast upon, he's not going to give you a stone. The fish that he invites you to eat, nourishment for your spirit, he's not going to give you a snake. He's not going to deceive you. This born again experience is very real. Those of us who are gathered here together and who have experienced it, we know it is, and we can thank God for it, and we can praise him for Christmas. Because Christmas is just a time where we remember what's been sent to us, what's been given to us in Jesus. And that's something to celebrate, amen? Be encouraged this Christmas. Be an ambassador for peace. When everything else is crashing down around, maybe you've got family that you're going to be with that don't know the Lord, and it's depressing, it's hard, because they're... Their eye is on everything else but God. Be that ambassador of peace in your family. I love this verse. Isaiah 26, 12 to 13. Isaiah had it right. He's calling out to God and he says, Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone we do honor. Do we honor? But Pastor Clint, I've heard this message of Christmas many times. Is this really going to change me? Is it really going to do something inside of me if I surrender, if I place my trust in Jesus? Friend, would you hear the word of the Lord today through Isaiah, who also writes in Isaiah 57, 15, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite 
and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Humble yourself today in the presence of God. Admit your need for him. Come to that term where you're willing to surrender. The Holy Spirit calls to you today to lay it down, to surrender. This is a beckoning from the Spirit of the living God. He will not turn you away. He revives the spirit of the lowly and the heart of the contrite before him. Would you humble yourself before God today and call out to him and say, Lord, I surrender. I see my need for you. I'm tired of struggling to find peace on my own terms. I admit that I have acknowledged Jesus is real, but I've been unwilling to yield my controls to him. Lord Jesus, today I call out to you and ask you to please forgive me, restore me, and be my savior. Today I turn to you and yield control to you. Rescue me from death, O Lord, and fill me with the living presence of your Holy Spirit that brings peace. I need you. I need a Savior. I need you. If you prayed that prayer, and you mean that with your heart, the Lord will forgive you of your sin, take your sin, has cast it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again, and he will take his spirit and fill you with his presence. And that, my friend, is the start of your journey into eternal life. Today, if that's you, I want you to come talk to me after the service. I'm going to Terry up here. I'll, I'll just hang around up here for a few minutes. Come talk to me. Let's pray. Let's start this out right. You can celebrate Christmas in the presence of God today. In this coming season, it's going to be different than you've ever experienced ever before because the lights are going to go on. <laughs> Amen. Let's bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you today and we ask that you would Stir our hearts to remember all the good things that you are and that you have done. For those of us who believe, Lord, help us not to put our eyes on the circumstances that draw us under the waves, Lord, that cause us to sink, but help us to, to look at you and to reach out to you, Lord. Would you lift us up by the hand, Lord? We are weak, but you are strong. Refresh us, Lord. Renew our first love for you. Draw us up, O oh Lord God, and help us to be peacemakers. Fill our hearts with your peace, joy, and love, and help us to be faithful ambassadors for you. God, for those that are here, are here who are listening online or here today that don't know you, I pray, God, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, that you would bless those ones who, who surrender their heart to you today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you folks in the coming week, should the Lord tarry. Amen.